Awesome Chat is brought to you by Sidekick Media Services. We are your sidekick in business for social media, video production, and more. Find out more at sidekickmediaservices.com. And listeners like you, support this show at patreon.com slash awesomecast. Hey guys, it's the Awesome Chat, Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter here, right, where we talk geeky and tech with uh, local people and, and abroad, uh, Pittsburgh and abroad, doing some great things uh, around businesses, technology, uh, social media, all kinds of fun things. Check out all the past interviews, tons of them over there on awesomecast.net or subscribe to the awesome chat on itunes stitcher spreaker iheart radio you know whenever uh, amazon web services is actually up mm. and uh of course video versions on the youtube and the facebook pages for awesome cast and you can please subscribe to the awesome cast um facebook page because we like to do these live whenever possible you never know who's going to stop in the studio when we're going to do things and sometimes we do announce those in advance so you can join us you don't know or maybe i'll just get something in the mail that i want to unbox on on facebook live out of nowhere uh, like we did also today uh so go check out all that stuff and please support the show patreon.com slash awesome cast you can become a member there and get some behind the scenes uh video as well in the state of the awesome cast so with me today is uh somebody a long time friend of the show Mm-hmm. um i think i hell i think i knew you before we had an awesome cast oh, scott really? simmons yes. joins us back in the, uh, back in the day days. pod yeah. camp days yeah i remember i rem- i don't think i ever told you this i remember way back in the day it was like pod camp three ish maybe yeah maybe and you're hanging out there with somebody in the sessions and you're chatting about stuff and i i, I happen to be east drive i would just have been sitting next to you i didn't kind of knew you were the scare house mm-hmm. guy at the time yeah. right yeah <laughs> and uh, i don't know if you were even sponsoring podcast pod camp at Not that, that point first year no, no or the first year i went no but uh but that was my i think that was my first kind of chance meeting with you yeah so that sounds about right and yeah, uh, maybe i said hi i don't know uh but uh, i probably mostly cut myself as i do but uh <laughs> <laughs> the father but yes I, I guess so i guess so just quietly in the back learning things taking notes mm-hmm. um but uh and of course we had you on an early episode of awesome cast yeah. way back in the day um so t- Scarehouse is your thing for those the uninitiated or those not in Pittsburgh. What is it? So, uh, Scarehouse, it's kind of a thing, and this is always <laughs> new. There you go. There's your 2017. There, there, yeah. uh, uh, and it's it's Florida. funny, you know, because it's the off season. We're only open mid September through Halloween, and so you know, I'm not doing as many media appearances and things this time of year. So, it's a little I'm a little rusty on this as I get rolling. Um, but uh, Scarehouse is a very elaborate haunted house in Pittsburgh that has been lucky enough to be recognized uh not only nationally but now we're getting international which is just crazy uh but scarehouse started as a small business i've always been a big halloween nerd i grew up working at all the haunted houses here locally back in the 80s and it just grew and grew and grew and now it is it is my full-time job i'm the co-owner along with my dad and creative director marketing director and work very closely with Dutters. I had to think about what how she's referred to in this world. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, was, she's the Dutters. She's the Katie, Dutters. Yeah, yeah. Katie, Katie is the Dutters. Katie right. is the Dutters, and um, lucky enough that yeah, Scarehouse is my full time job. I and Dutters and a lot of us we get paid to scare people, and we do it all year long. Not only coming up with new content, changing Scarehouse around every year, but also uh, we do not have outside ad agencies or PR firms, so we have to produce the event in terms of actually making the haunted house, making all the scary stuff, but then also promote it and then also do all the, all the things that are related to it. So it, it fills up the year pretty darn quickly. Mm-hmm. And it's been interesting. You know, of course, Katie's a part of the awesome cast and we talk about, you know, social media a lot and, and the marketing side and, you know, just chats I have with her as a friend, you know, just like all the stuff you guys go through, <laughs> I guess yeah. through, through the year is pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's funny because, we both Katie and I have to do a lot of the did I say have to? I meant get to <laughs> a lot of networking. Right. It's great. Um, you know, going to different events, trying to interest sponsors, marketing partners, going to functions. And the question we get asked the most is, well, what do you do for the rest of the year? Or what is the building for the rest of the year? Well, the 
building is a haunted house year round. It's just not open. You know, we're building the haunted house right. year round. So, so people think about like, oh, you build up the haunted house, uh, like like these these places. Like, I think regionally, more, yeah, right. Yeah. Like, like in small towns, like, oh, we're gonna go to take the church or the temple or the rec center and turn it into a haunted house. Right? Yeah. So many misconceptions, and I mean, that's part of why we embraced social media. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why we embrace social media, but putting a lot of this content and photos and videos and things online to show people to help because even though the industry has changed so much, get your podcast going. Sorry about that. The industry has changed (laughs) so much that, but there's still that misconception of, Oh, like you said, it's, this is the JCs. This is a bunch of kids in a barn. Like, no, these are very Hollywood quality, elaborate, effects and sets and scenes that take a long time to get right to put together and you know our audience we have a very loyal fan base they come out every year they want to see new stuff you know they want to mm-hmm. i like to think of every year of scarehouse is basically the next in a series you know there was a while there i think it was with the saw movies and the paranormal um, activity movies where like every year there was a new one that's what scarehouse is doing and you're not going to come out every year if it's exact same year to year and it's this was an analogy that somebody on our team came up with of when people say well why does it take you know what are you doing for the rest of the year think about if you live in a house residential house and you go okay i'm going to fix my bathroom or i'm going to fix up my kitchen kitchen might be a good example when you go oh, wow how long is it going to take you to fix up your kitchen like oh it's going to take me like six months uh, even a lot of people say well six months it might take you a little bit longer than that by the time you change this around change this um, I think Scarehouse itself, just on the main floor, is like the attraction itself is close to fifteen, sixteen thousand square feet, and we're usually changing fifty to sixty percent of it. So, okay, well, we're responsible for changing the interior of nine thousand square feet of highly elaborate, sophisticated theatrical stuff, new technology. Like, yeah, that's going to take about ten months to do. Mm-hmm. Plus coming up with new marketing campaigns, updating the website, doing the video. Um, we Our staff size grows to over 150 people on payroll, mostly seasonal. Well, we got to hire them, got to train them, got to do it. Like it. It's remarkable how much that, how much time that takes. And yeah, it is not just what are we going to do? You know, what spooky sheets are we going to put, put up on the walls this year? <laughs> like it's a big thing. Yeah, it, it is really elaborate. I've, I've been through the lights on tours and everything and just behind the scenes, just, you know, other things around there. And uh, it, it is really interesting to see how, you know, I've always like want to stay and look at things instead yes. of moving on to the next yeah. thing to jump out at me. Right. Well, um, we're, we're all big Disney nerds and we all take. <laughs> Which is, you know, it, look at the scare house stuff. We're all Disney nerds. Oh, the nerdiest. <laughs> the, the people behind the scenes of scare house, such nerds. It's. Mm. Um, there's a lot of Disney music playing. There's a lot of talk of Hamilton. <laughs> uh, a lot of ex- a lot of excitement when we're dog friendly office. A lot of excitement when all the dogs come in. Um, but Disney nerds, theme park nerds, in terms of that idea of like the best theme park attractions, like Tower of Terror, Haunted Mansion, Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, Diagon Alley, which is more than an attraction; it's a whole thing. Um. There's, it's not just doing it for the sake of doing it. When you pack these places with so much detail and so much layering of stuff on top of stuff on top of stuff, it's actually good business sense as an attraction because you cannot possibly see everything on one trip. Mm -hmm. So it encourages you to come again. And then also it allows that sense of over delivering, you know, there, I have definitely been through attractions, not just in haunted houses, but experiences where I go through once and they go, do you want to go through again? Like, no, I, I think I kind of got it. I got all the stuff that's going on. But when you, I'm a huge movie nerd as well. Like movies that seem very, very dense with layered stuff and meaning, you know, the, we were just talking the other day about the uh, Mad Max Fury Road. And that is a movie I saw multiple times in the theater. I just posted a thing online of somebody put up a whole series of photos of every vehicle in that movie. And you just see, how much design thought went into it, but not just design for the sake of, oh, we're just doing this because it's cool. Everything has a reason for being there and there's a thought process behind it was there and a story behind why there's this little frou-frou-y thing on 
the steering wheel and why it's this color versus that color. That that level of really deep design is fascinating. And I think it's something that the majority of the people going through, they don't necessarily notice it in a very specific way, but they sense it if it's not there. Mm -hmm. You know, they sent you can sense when you're going through anything that's highly designed. If you're like, eh, they just kind of threw this off. This this feels somehow less than. But if you're going through an experience and you're feeling like, wow, they really thought about a lot of different elements of all this stuff to fit together, um, they really respond to it. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, you talk about a little bit of like through the years, um, you know, uh, you know, using technology, I, I think, you know, speaking at one point, like things like PodCamp were really influential on in how you yeah. kind of latch on to that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, can oh, you, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the things that things you've tried over the years <laughs> and maybe things that didn't work out over the yeah. years that you've learned? Like, you know, we, we all do this, you know, doing this show, doing everything. We, we, we learn things the hard way, right? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, the, there's there are only so many hours in the day. Right. And that's the thing as I was listening to, you know, start an intro on this. And I thought, man, that's like a Chris Hardwick level of... I got five minutes. What else can I produce as new content here? Yes, and yeah. there, I think there have been a lot of things that Scarehouse has done that we start and we realize we do not have the time to commit to this project because this project is so much more time consuming than we thought it would be or requires a thought process. And I think that is something that Katie and I both struggle with because we get excited about new ideas I'm like oh we could do that we could do that we could do that mm -hmm. and then two weeks go by and you're out, you're going oh I think we forgot to sell tickets this week because we're so busy <laughs> on this new thing this new thing so that that's been something that we've really been forcing ourselves over the last couple of years to really be disciplined on the ROI of a thing um, you know last year on thinking I can think of our YouTube channel has done very well for us, but it's, it's taken time. You know, we're up to 5 million views right now and that's great. And when you talk about things that have worked and things that haven't worked the first few years, I come from a background in television production. I worked at local TV station doing their topicals and things. And the first couple of years of YouTube, we've always made these very cinematic trailers and cinematic videos and those have done very well for us. And I love doing that. You know, I'm a big movie nerd and that's so far the closest I've been able to get to living out my ideas of being a director of being, you know, doing these 90 second mini movies basically, or trailers for movies that will never actually, that the experience of going through the scares is the movie, if you will. But our behind the scenes right from the beginning we identified that people want to see behind the scenes of what goes into scarehouse the process of all this design all the weird things that happen and for the first few years on our youtube channel those videos were as heavily produced as the trailers and they kind of felt like it they had voiceover like they looked like those kind of epk things you get on the dvd features of everyone's talking in sound bites and they're really fast moving. And like the, that doesn't really work. It's, it's especially now with everyone being so connected. So what's been working better for us now is doing more videos that are much more casual and much more transparent and open still. And it's been fun for me to sort of figure out where is that balance? Because I, I still want it to look like a well-produced, thing but how do you make a behind the scenes video that still shows off the amount of work and the personality that goes into doing the stuff we're doing but it can't look like okay this is take four of this thing and oh let me adjust this light let me do that so i think the that approach has worked better i think the things that we've tried in, in terms of digital and technology and marketing have been the things that and to Dutter's credit, she was the one who noticed this. We were definitely doing videos that made us laugh. And that's fine if you're doing it just as a lark. But there were a lot of things we were doing that were just so bizarre and so weird. And you go, this is not only not selling tickets, but this is making people who watch some of these videos feel like this crowd has a bunch of inside jokes that I don't get and feel almost like we're putting a wall up. Like, no, we need you know, as a brand, we need to be a little bit more inclusive. We need to let people in, in on things. Absolutely. Um, 
there was one thing that we we've talked about it on the awesome cast you know again kind of playing with technology like i'm surprised that the blow up and i know we're supposed to have a part of this conversation on, on your podcast yes. too and then end up talking about a ton of other things but we, we got in and got to play a little bit with 360 video um and as you're seeing kind of like these new technologies and like kind of things to play with mm. you know what did you think of a, an experiment like that and and you know how do you kind of take on those kinds of ideas of do we try this tool i know we, we were well, before the podcast yeah i was showing you kind of a new toy we have here yeah. in the studio yeah that, and uh we're you know and, and i can see the gears roll oh a yeah little bit, oh you know? yeah, yeah absolutely we're definitely in the same vein with those yeah. things you know but uh but i mean that was something that yeah, again you know, you know fortunate to come in and be able to play in your space a little bit yeah with with, with uh some some hardware we had um yeah how do you take on like kind of like those new kind of technology ideas like that and hardware and things like that um a lot of times it's funny uh my my girlfriend has a says i have has expressed has defined my mental process as everything informs everything and meaning like i can take an analogy from the most bizarre place and apply it to haunted houses i'm going to give you an example of that of by quoting paul williams uh Paul Williams is the singer songwriter still alive subject of a great documentary called, uh, I think it's actually called still alive. And I was listening to an interview with Paul Williams who wrote rainbow connection. He was in smoking abandoned movies. Um, I go off on tangents. Um, and he said that he figured out that his brain takes in for information and then processes things in the background because he would struggle with, like he said, rainbow connection, for example, he was struggling with trying to come up with a line, come up with whatever. Finally, he got just, I think it was rainbow connection, just got frustrated, walked away from it. And he said it was two weeks later, he suddenly went, oh, I got it out of nowhere. And he said he realized in the back of his mind, like some part of his brain was still figuring that out. Mm -hmm. And he was just like, I got this, just push me in the back. And I find with technology, a lot of times, that's how my brain works not just in technology, but a lot of things like I'll react to something and I'll go, you know, I think sometimes my subconscious is much faster than front of brain. Mm -hmm. And so using an example of not even new technology, but just adapting technology, uh, a few years ago, I just by sheer dumb luck, I was able to go to Sundance for half a day. I was already in Salt Lake city. It, <laughs> I was actually in Salt Lake City for an even weirder reason, visiting a friend who runs a haunted house in Salt Lake City, uh, who actually we've talked to on a Scarehouse podcast a couple years ago. See, here's how the tangents go. This is why Dutters is always very frustrated in my meetings. <laughs> People say, oh, a haunted house in Salt Lake City. Like, yeah, a really successful haunted house in Salt Lake City. In fact, haunted houses are incredibly popular in Salt Lake City. Why? Not because of the occult, they all tend to stay away from it. Salt Lake City, a lot of Mormons, means a lot of young people who don't drink, who don't go out to bars, they're looking for things to do. Hey, there's a giant haunted house. Ba-boom. Anyway, um, I was happened to be in Salt Lake City in January anyway, realized Sundance was open, went up there, Abadook, actually, and part of being at Sundance is there are just all these sort of cafes and lounges and things that are showing off the new toys, the new technology. And somebody was basically showing off a kind of portable ring light system that you could take with you on shoots. And for those of you who haven't done production, the ring light is literally just a ring that goes around the camera and has all these sort of uh, bare bulbs and gives a kind of a very sort of glamorous look and then sometimes is as a style choice, you can choose to get the actual ring light in the eyes and it gives a, just a very unusual look. It's used sometimes in like Missy Elliott videos and things sort of over the top style. But I saw that and I thought, well, that's really interesting. And it was just, again, in the back of the head, back of the head. And it was probably two months later when we were at that time talking about doing behind the scenes videos and the idea came up of, I really want to profile the people who are making all this stuff happen and have insights into the process, costuming, makeup, et cetera. So we ended up building our own ring light, you know, unlike the one we saw at Sundance, which was very fancy. Ours was like two by fours and things and still have it by the way. And so that was a thing of seeing a thing and not going instantly like, Oh, here's, here's what I can use for monster movies or this or what have you. Um, and I do that same process with like apps on the phone. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of just 
downloading weird film apps and then it's usually a couple weeks later like oh right now i know now i remember what i can do with that thing but it's interesting when you say when i say about the ring light that was a good example of we did this whole series of videos that year and they were fairly successful and i think they worked well to introduce the people who do this but very quickly again going back and I think that's something that serves Scarehouse very well is being able to adapt to the data and the times. I'm really proud of those videos, again, still on our YouTube channel, but realizing, okay, they look very, again, they look very produced and processed. So how it's our behind the scenes videos now are a little bit grungier and grainier. And that was probably decided because I saw some interest, you know, that was just changed because the things you can do with your Apple, with your iPhone, with some of these other cameras, like, well, that's HD. We can make that work. So mm -hmm. constantly sort of using the technology at hand and then not just making the videos you want to make, but going like, okay, this is the way, the way people are watching videos, the way people are engaging with this content. Nobody wants to watch on their phone some heavily produced thing. Mm -hmm. When we did the heavily produced thing with the ring light that I'm talking about, that was a few years ago, right when people were starting to adjust to, oh, there are more and more HD videos on YouTube. YouTube videos should be more cinematic. So we're, you know, our videos, our behind the scenes videos that year were incredibly cinematic. Now people are watching them on their phone out of the corner of their eye, like, all right, well, there's no point in being cinematic anymore. We can make it more run and gun. More adapting for the Facebook culture, the YouTube culture, yeah. like as it is now. Yeah. So. Or 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 having uh, Princess Holly read uh, Kanye's tweets. Kanye's tweets, you know, yeah, things like that. <laughs> well, and that's been a fun. As I look down on that, that's a really something that has been fun with all this different technology, and it took time to sort of slowly adjust to it. But I'd say for the first few years of the YouTube channel on Scarehouse, all the videos looked kind of uniform. They all looked very professional, very uh, produced, and I've maintained, tweaked it slightly, but on the big trailers, the big sort of narrative videos, the look of them has changed as we've used different kinds of cameras and gear. But if I've done it right, you should be able to watch, say, the trailer from 2004 and then the trailer from 2016. And you might go like, wow, the, the production scale of the things have changed, but they all look kind of similar. There's like mm -hmm. a definite selection that we make in terms of color choices and contrast and uh, impact and, and all that kind of stuff. Whereas the other behind the scenes videos are like the weird, like you say, Princess Holly reads mean tweets that gets a much more varied kind of look. And that to me is where it's been fun with the technology and the 360 that you did of, all right, let's make this YouTube channel a little bit more experimental and we can sort of play with it. And you and I were talking earlier that to me, when you're making these videos, and doing things online, the benefit of being affiliated with something that's scary and horror related is, oh, it can be grainy. It can be out of focus. It can be kind of weird. Like Princess Holly doing, reading the tweets is like, it's deliberately overlit and grainy and nasty. Mm -hmm. And that's fortunate because I've been in video production one form or another for almost 30 years now. My skill set is not being the guy in the camera and making it look pretty. But with technology now, as long as I'm shooting something and I'm like, all right, it appears to be in focus and it appears, <laughs> you know, there's enough exposure where I can see everything. Then I can go in and post and make it look more like a thing mm -hmm. uh, that has really benefited us in a big way. And that's where you look at the amount of videos we produce Scarehouse, you know, that very first year, the YouTube channel, I think we did three or four videos a year last year. I think we did 50 so, and Jeez. it's because we have the phone and the you can scale. And stuff. I mean, it's and you can scale. It is yeah. scalability and it's getting out and it's kind of communicating a little bit more, right? Yeah. And so. it's, I, you can't, you need to have a little bit of everything, but it's wild to me that there are definitely cases where the big heavily produced video that we do, that we spend a lot of money on, sometimes it gets fewer videos than that thing I did on my phone one time. It was kind of funny. And it can be tempting when you look at that data to go like, well, let's not spend money on the big production anymore. Like, no, mm -hmm, no, 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 mm -hmm. kind of need both. And that applies to our marketing conversations too. We have that all the time. Like it's great when you can do that thing on social media of, 
we posted that weird thing on Facebook with no money behind it and we reached tens of thousands of people. Well, that's great, but you still also need to spend the money on the radio and the traditional advertising. Like they've got to balance each other out. Yeah. Cause I mean, even for you, you have kind of a more traditional business in the long run too. Yeah. That yeah. Will, will attract those people that still reach the, 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 the radio. But again, you're not just throwing everything at radio and yeah, no. printing the streets. Like there's, there's more strategy behind it than there would have been in maybe even well, 10 years ago. Yeah. I think, I mean, this gets into marketing strategy stuff, but I think there's definitely a, there's so much new and exciting stuff that you can do on social media, of course, and a lot of these other methods and a lot of the old methods are not working as well. And the ROI, you know, the ROI of a good Facebook campaign is much better than TV, radio, et cetera. But TV, radio still work. It's not like, you know, all the stuff works in one way. It's just a matter of you only have so much money to make it work. Absolutely. Um, Let's talk about a little bit real quick, the technology in the scare house. Oh yeah. You know, obviously stuff you developed over, I, I got to see a little bit of the behind the scenes here and there about some of your systems and the security and how you kind of keep an eye on things. Yeah. Like there's, and again, there's behind the scenes about the sound design, about yeah. the lighting. There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, like what's kind of the most like kind of impressive, or maybe you don't notice kind of technology that you, you, you've maybe applied over the last several years or, is, or is there a lot of old school kind of concepts? It's, it's the thing I love about, Scarehouse is, I mean, I love a lot about Scarehouse, but our approach, I love when we can mix old school and new school and mix like some, in the same way that sometimes we'll have the most elaborate set and character in the world that we have spent months building and creating and do this incredibly elaborate thing. And then the very next scene is a cheese ball three dollar <laughs> scare that i was doing back in this in the 80s and it still works and it's like well again and again it's that balance like you couldn't do scarehouse could not exist if it was just all five dollar scares but then it also wouldn't be effective if it was all the really expensive things too and with us the technology is the same way like we um we have a lot of technology in a way of the animations and effects and it's great because in the haunted house industry, there is an actual trade show you can go to. And what's great is guys who used to do special effects for movies are now doing mask making and things for the haunted houses because CGI in movies means there's not as much work for them to make the masks, the characters, the creatures, and they're able to do these little control boxes that are, you know, they're tiny. They could fit in the size of your hand. And what will happen is uh, Nino, who is our operations manager, but really our guru when it comes to all this tech stuff, he can essentially, you can go in with all the servos and reprogram these animations every year. And that's something that's been great is, so you can, you know, you go to the trade show. We have the haunted attraction industry has a trade show in St. Louis every March. And, you know, we will buy, a animation that's been created where it's say zombie comes out and he moves his arms left and right. And he's run by a little digital control box that puts out digital sound. What is so much fun for us is the technology is such that every year we can redress that character and change the sound effect he makes, even change his animation. So maybe one year he, that same character is the zombie that's coming out trying to get you. Next year, we hang him upside down, redress him, and he's the victim who is flailing for help. Um, you know, those little sort of, and it's all, you know, again, as we say, like, this is the kind of stuff wasn't that long ago. If you want to have like a audio animatronic figure, you're dealing with theme parks, you're dealing with um, Gilderfluke systems. Gilderfluke was this, I think they were, I want to say they, there might, there's still some animations out there running Gilderfluke, but like Gilderfluke was, I remember back in what would have been the eighties and like gremlins Two and some of the big special effect creatures, they have these incredibly elaborate computer devices that you had to like be an engineer to figure out how to reprogram. Now it's just, you know, you're plugging an SD card into a laptop and it's your sequence to program, reprogram these animations is just like a video editing or a PowerPoint timeline of your essentially moving little blocks around and saying, okay, at this point, do this, at this point, do that. Um, probably the, but I think the most 
technology we're using is probably more in terms of our sound design right now Mm -hmm. of using it for you know these little boxes that can put up to like 16 channels of audio and really just fill the space in such a way and we want to do more of that more like that show control kind of thing of we do a lot now where you trip a motion sensor and a monster comes out and makes a sound as we've gotten more used to the technology now it's the ability of you can have an actor push a button and i think this is a thing that we're really going to start doing more with of where it used to be actor jumps out and has to scream then it became okay the actor jumps out and he pushes a button and there's a light that comes on. Now you can have a thing where the actor can actually jump out, push a button. There's a sound effect. There's a light. Maybe the lighting in the room changes. Like you can do all this stuff off a push of button in the same way. Like, you know, if, if you're with home control now, we have these things like, okay, when I push a button, this lights goes off, the music starts, the things like to be able to do that in the haunted house where an entire room can Wait, change. So you're applying home automation to in some the cases, haunted house yeah. in some rooms. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. And it's, you know, it's very much like whatever works. Like mm-hmm. what is, I say all this, we have, and so, there are some places in, and you, and I'll, I'll be honest, you can't tell going through. There's, there's, there are some places where there might be a sound or lighting effect that took a really long time to figure out with like reprogramming digital, this, that, and the other a lot of the sound source in Scarehouse is off of these little $35 MP3 players that um, are getting harder and harder to make, which makes my budget sad. But, <laughs> um, you know, in, in the little, uh, little, you can get them on Amazon, these little $35 MP3 players that you plug into USB power. And we just put one you know 20 minute audio loop on that, hook it up to a thing. And you go that, some of our the most big impressive sound systems in the room i mean there are definitely and there are definitely places in our attraction where we have really expensive elaborate speakers with subwoofers and they're running off of this thumb drive or this little <laughs> tiny little thing but it's like if it works it works you like like an i like is it like an ipod shuffle kind of thing or just ipod one shuffle little... what, what am i made of money these are like the small <laughs> little Small yeah. little things, the, yeah. the creative zen or something. Yeah, you know. Oh yeah, and and it's the same way in lighting. There are, I will say, like I am so the majority of our lighting is all LED based. Mm-hmm. Um, it is. We have a guy. We we got a guy. Uh, <laughs> who comes? I, gotta, in, I, I love it. You're you're one of the you're like that's the that's kind of like the 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 point where you're like I got a guy to handle that. Oh, I got yeah, a, yeah. I got I got I got guys and girls in all kinds of weird places, but <laughs> like he. Bert actually created his company's mini spotlight and he um, he's sort of mastered the idea of taking those little LED lights and making sort of little torpedo versions of them basically. And they are perfect for the haunted house business because that is the hardest thing is hiding the lights in the room. So mm-hmm. it's not like big clamp lights hanging down. And uh, he continues to find new, you talk about new technology. You know, I will go to the show in a few weeks and he will show me all the toys and I'll go, all right. And then three weeks, you know, and then we go back to design meetings and we're thinking, and sometimes it's a matter of like, Oh, Bert showed us a toy. How can we fit a scene around that? Mm -hmm. And then other times it's bringing Bert out and going, can you make a whole room full of candles that are all like basically these little battery led lights. And, you know, there are a few places in, in scare house where we've got very, like in the big theater, for example, where, we had to have a lighting designer come in from CMU and he put all the lights up and he built a board for it. And it's all like one, you push a button and this thing to this thing to this thing. And then maybe the scene before it is little red screw and light bulbs that I still get at home Depot for $4. I'm like, Mm -hmm. this is amazing to me that I'm still intermixing like state of the art digital technology with the little ping pong ball size red light bulb that I was using back at the YMCA haunted house in the eighties, but it all <laughs> like the more you get into this stuff, the more you go, like it really is more about the telling the story or trying to create the look than the actual tools and, and knowing the tool for the job too. Yes. Yeah. And that was probably the best, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got when I was in high school, you know, they had sort of the career day. And even back then I knew I wanted to get into, at that point I wanted to get into film production, but I was aware that, TV video production was an option, was a thing that existed. 
And the person who came in and addressed, you know, our little group of people who wanted to get into this said, you know, it's much more important to learn communication and writing and the ability to tell a story or convey a message. Because even then, and that would have been back in the late 80s, she said technology is always changing. And she nobody could have imagined how much it was going to change. But so many people, when they're trying to get into production, at least back then, and probably still now, they get into production. They think the way to get into production is I'm going to know every last aspect of how the camera works and how to do this thing and do this thing. And like, even then realizing like, well, in two years, that camera will be obsolete. How do you tell a story in 30 seconds or less? How do you convey it? How Mm -hmm. do you, and that's, that served me very well that, you know, the same when in the nineties, I was doing these very expensive uh, TV commercials and, you know, you'd have the crew come in, we were shooting on film, we were doing all that. I'm using the same, skill set and mindset of how to convey a story, how to make an interesting shot, how to edit these things together. But now I'm shooting stuff on, on a phone or a little like, you know, little camera that we got at a show once it's like part flashlight, part camera. Like it's all the same. Like you say, you're adapt, you're adapting the tool for the, the, um, the story you're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. And I definitely know of at least one guy specifically who was a contemporary of me and he, totally went into the route of I'm going to become a camera guy. I don't need to know all that stuff. I don't need to it's know. A me- it's like becoming a mechanic, right? As yeah. opposed to, I don't know, a design, a car designer. Yeah. And he, this guy, like one of his big things was he said, like, I, I'm going to be studio camera. He wanted to be a studio camera operator. He wanted mm-hmm. to be the guy that would be like in the studio, running the camera, switching. And I think five years later, robotic camera showed up. <laughs> And then years after that, like now it's all just like what used to be done. And well, I remember what used to be done by like four or five people is now just very much like what you're doing. Like just all the big news shows now is just one person sitting like the, like the wizard of Oz, just making this camera move, making mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was always interesting. The, the, the one time I got to be on a, a local main studio production and I'm just in a room. We sit down, I sit on the set with the host and yeah. then the camera operator guy walks across this long room and through a door. Yeah. And then the cameras start moving and we, we sometimes I'll hear him over a speaker. Like that was it, you know, like, like that, that kind of detached thing, you know, one of the most fascinating. And then at the time prophetic things I ever did was this would have been, I want to say mid to late nineties. I was in, so I've always, when, when the haunted house, I still do this, not as much as I would like, but as we were building scare house up, I, we would take road trips and basically mm-hmm. go to parts of the country where there are clusters of haunted houses because scare house was not always open every year. Um, you know, we opened in 99 and then we had like some years we couldn't find the location bounced around. So in the early two thousands, I was spending a lot of time. Like we would try to find a location, try to find something to make it work. Wouldn't work. And like, all right, well we can't, open at least we can learn by going to a bunch of other haunted houses and you know that all benefited us considerably and you know once we moved into the building we're in now we moved into that building in 2007 so it's coming on it's now 10 years we've been in the same building working year round using all that knowledge we learned from going through all those haunted houses in the early 2000s but we're in um near the philadelphia area which is where qvc originates so we actually took a tour of QVC studios and I was able to, that was one of the reasons why I was so glad at that point I was freelance. And I remember that was when I saw the future of broadcast television and QVC is, you know, a home shopping network. And I really encourage anybody who's in production or marketing, if you're ever in that, that side of the state, take the QVC tour it is fascinating as a business model and to see just how few people are running it. Like it is remarkable. Like it really is. I, my memory is like maybe two people, like the producer is just like radio style. The producer is queuing the talent. She's watching like the, the, the amount of stuff that's being sold online. She's queuing up callers. And yeah, there's that one guy who's running one guy or girl who's, 
running the audio, making the cameras work, queuing the models, doing the thing. Like wow. it's it's nuts. So I'm on the right track. You're here. on the right track. Yeah. <laughs> here as I'm live switching, playing with our new toy, you guys might be seeing on video. Yeah. Making sure the audio is okay. Got the live stream in the chat yeah. room. Like that, that's that, I mean, that's the model. That's yeah. the professional oh, model, yeah. right? And it's and and sure enough, I you know, I saw that and then went to at that point i was still freelancing at the local television station and at that point they still had they had robotic they had robotic cameras and a fairly big amount of people in the control room and i remember having that sense of like i don't think this is going to stay this way much longer and sure enough when they knew that that particular tv station new building new control room that Mm -hmm. new control room real real small uh probably about actually about the size of this room and <laughs> and i it was all like all it all came true it all was like oh yep yep and i i will say this this is one of the things that cracks me up now when when you see on social media people have opinions and i will see them see like a typo on a chiron on a local news station like oh somebody lost their job like no they did not that you have no idea how much the people on camera and behind camera how much multitasking they're doing in a day. And like, I Mm -hmm. think there's this misconception on the local news level, especially that, Oh, there's like a team of makeup artists and stylists. And this person, you know, there's one person responsible for typing in the names. Like, no, like everybody is doing like 17. (laughs) They're they're fitting that in while they're doing all the other things. Yeah. 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 And guess what? They're going to be typos and miscues and everything else. And they're just making it work. Absolutely. It's impressive to see things like, you know, I, you know, being a wrestling fan, you know, and seeing the big productions they do. And every time there is a mistake, it's like glaring, right? Because they're right on. Yeah. You know. Well, yeah. I mean, think about mistakes. We're recording this just a few days after the Oscars on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I am. I, 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 I've been watching that video, like the Sapruder film, like, mm-hmm. and they're actually video, they're like videos online. I love this. It actually break down like freeze frame and point out like, like it's like a post game. Like they'll circle one guy's face and like, here's the point where he just realized what's happening here, you know, and then play it. And here's what Warren, here's what's probably going through Warren Beatty's eyes. And <laughs> here's when this one communicated this. And like, I really, I I was thinking about this. I could probably do a whole seminar on crisis aversion and like all the <laughs> steps that went wrong for that to happen. Mm-hmm. And like step by step by step, how this person should have reacted, how this person should have done this, how that like it's, it's and how much of it also is, is, you know, actors that are just like, hand me the thing, read the thing. Yeah. Right. So, so they're not prepared for live interaction like this. Most cases. No, no. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, the multitasking, all of us multitask. Yeah. Right. Especially in this room, but there's a great indicator of, multitasking does have an impact. And I don't know if you've been keeping up on this story, but this has come out fairly recently that so again, tangents, everything informs everything. So for those, I think everyone knows the whole story that basically the accountant who was responsible for handing Warren Beatty, the the best picture envelope accidentally gave him the envelope for the award that had already been given for Emma Stone. Mm-hmm. And that's how this whole thing happened. And you go like, how could that accountant screwed it up. He had one job. Well, you look on his Twitter timeline and he, this post very quickly deleted after people found it. The, that particular accountant had posted a photo of Emma Stone backstone with her, uh, Emma Stone backstage with her Oscar. So basically not saying that had something to do with it, but at the point when that accountant, his one job that he had at that given point was to make sure Warren Beatty got the right envelope. He would have been, tweeting a photo of Emma Stone and posting his whole thing like I'm here with Emma Stone and their Oscar like mm-hmm. chances are he which is was, the thing that's encouraged to show the behind yep. the scenes because that's the culture right now it's the biggest yep. event everybody make sure you get your tweets but don't forget to do the yeah. first job so chances are <laughs> and that's you know and that tweet has since been deleted uh-huh. and uh-huh. the accounting firm said yeah he, he shouldn't like at some point you know he took his mind off that envelope and was like Oh wait, what what you know, what hashtag can I use for Emma Stone? And as he's think probably all conjecture, <laughs> as he's thinking of what clever hashtag to put up, hashtag Warren Beatty's standing there with like a ticking time bomb, like, oh, oh, this is bad. It's uh-huh. yeah. yeah. Wow. 
Well, on that note, yes. <laughs> This uh, is why Dutters gets frustrated because we have like, you can ask her if you, we, we have meetings and we have objectives and then they're like, let me tell you something about, I learned from Hamilton and we go <laughs> way off. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Same thing with our meetings. Um, but <laughs> anyways, uh, the scare house, yeah, of course you guys are doing stuff all year, follow the YouTube page, follow the Facebook, follow the Twitter and uh, you guys actually even just did uh, something over the Valentine's Day. Yes. With yeah. the basement. So yeah. Valentine's Day bit. basement event. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we will probably, we'll be ramping up the, the content we produce soon. You know, we, we tend to lie low in the winter because people, you know, I think, I think sometimes as a seasonal business, especially something related to Halloween, haunted houses, you have to go away. You know, mm-hmm. you don't want to, you don't want to be too obnoxious, but uh, yeah, you'll start seeing some content from us, especially on YouTube soon and Scarehouse podcast. If you like this kind of thing. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so, so much. Scott Simmons, Scarehouse Scott on the Twitter. Yep. Go hit him up over there. And of course you can uh, uh, follow everything in all the chats over at awesomecast.net. Please, uh, uh, you know, consider supporting this patreon.com slash awesome cast and, uh, and, and subscribe to the awesome chat and the awesome cast on your iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, or even the YouTube and the Facebook video versions of it. Uh, thank you so much to my awesome guest, Scott, for joining us here in the Mayhem Studio in the wonderful Beach Food neighborhood here in Pittsburgh, PA. You've been our awesome audience. Have an awesome week.